Here are the ways that they are moving towards net zero with their own direct and indirect emissions, which are not the bulk of emissions. These are the things that you're in control of in your company. And then there's the indirect emissions, and that's all of us. And anyone who makes medical devices, anyone who makes medicines, anyone who serves the NHS through its food or building things, all of their emissions. And then there is that pesky travel group there for um, us to think about. So here's where they're going to get their emission savings from in the plan that's going to be in 56 countries near you soon. And here is the bit that's us as medical devices. It's a big part of the expectation. So, good morning everyone. My name's Michelle Sullivan. I work as the Head of Public Affairs for Boston Scientific. But I'm here this morning because accidentally I've become an expert on environmental sustainability and the move to net zero. And Joe's a skeptic, allegedly, mm -hmm. uh, but he is American, so that explains right. that. But um, a year and a half ago, if you'd have said I'd be still on the stage, but I do this quite a bit now, talking to people about environmental sustainability how medical devices are going to become net zero, how we're going to reduce our carbon footprint, what this all means. I would not have believed you. I didn't know anything about it, other than my son was really into it, who made me clean up the beach once. And supply chain, NHS supply chain came to us and said, what's Boston Scientific doing about environmental sustainability? And I said, I have no clue. Let me go and find out. I went away and I discovered a whole team of engineers and people that were working on scope one, two and three emissions and I was like, what the hell are they? And um, I joined a few calls and I started to pick up some information and in the end I was the only commercial person that was there and I said, I need to understand this terminology because I, I don't know what you're talking about. So I did a, a small eight week course with Cambridge University, it's called Sustainable, they, they have a, a whole sort of department which is an institute of sustainability leadership and people go there from all walks of life, all different companies to learn for eight weeks how to be a leader in sustainability and it takes 10 hours a week allegedly, I think it's a bit more than that but at the end of it I know miners, I know people from oil and gas industry, I know people from Abel and Coal, I met people from Aberdeen Council there are loads of finance people, loads of banks, the banks are all over this. And it became obvious this is not going anywhere and this is only going to get bigger. And how they describe it is, it's the next industrial revolution and we're about to, we're about to feel what that means. And we're about to see how that changes our society and how we go about business. And so today I'm just going to talk you through a little bit about why we care about this and then try to stimulate our thoughts as to how we can make this happen in a world of medical devices where we care about people's health, where things are made of plastic and precious metals, where things are disposable, where we don't know how to start this. So I'm gonna try and get us to think in the right way and make it possible in your brains. So I don't need this anymore. So I'll stand behind the thing. Impressive start, ladies and gentlemen, don't you think? <laughs> Thanks. So, right, I start with this picture. And I chose this picture because you can see a little sort of blue fuzz around it, and that is our atmosphere. And if you set off from the surface of the planet in your car, as if you were driving on a normal 60 mile an hour um, road, you would set off from the surface of the planet in your car and you would break out of the Earth's atmosphere in five minutes. That's how small it is. And what Al Gore says is, we're using this as an open sewer. And it's got a finite space and a finite thing and it protects us. Now, this is interesting. No one knows who said this, but it's brilliant. Anyone who thinks you can have infinite growth in a finite environment is either a madman or an economist. The minute you start to think about that, it's like bonkers, right? We've got this finite thing, but 
how our whole society is built on growth, growth, growth. So, what do you think these two things have in common? We have an oil rig and we have some tomatoes. Got any ideas? Joe? Greenhouses. Greenhouses, very good. So, they both require energy. To they do, exactly that. Now, I read this brilliant book. Um, it's called How the World Really Works. I'd super recommend it because it helps us to think about this in a sensible way. We are all addicted to fossil fuels. And if you were sitting in Stockholm in April and you had on your plate a tomato for your lunch, it was a medium-sized tomato, and um, it had come from southern Spain, because it likely would do at that time of year, at Easter, that tomato would have taken between six and eight tablespoons of oil to get to your plate. That's how addicted we are. You and mean the equivalent of it, producing it, that? It, it literally, you would have used that in energy... Oh, I see. ...to get that to you, to grow it, to transport it, to further transport it, right? Mm. So, you know, this isn't something where we can go, let's not use fossil fuels. You know, you're all wearing stuff that's built on fossil fuels. Half the world's food couldn't exist if we didn't use fertilisers. You know, we're totally addicted to this. So we're going to have to think what we're doing. Now, the other thing that happens is sometimes people say, I don't believe this has got anything to do with it. Somebody said to me the other day, someone I really respect, someone I've worked with for years, the IPCC report, which I'll come on to in a minute, says... The temperature hasn't gone up in 30 years. And I'm like, okay, right, this isn't actually true. You're, you're cherry-picking things that aren't true. But the IPCC, these are all scientists that volunteer constantly to update the world about what's going on. And 1,200 or so of them all agree that this is what's going on. And it's sort of getting impossible to refute it now, but we still manage to. So here on the left... These are carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuels, and you can see how fast our society, which is built on the energy of fossil fuels, has sucked them up and used them and emitted into the atmosphere that's five kilometres high, carbon dioxide. And carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, things like methane, nitrous oxide used in health services, got some interesting stories about that, they create a problem that means that our earth can't get rid of the heat so quickly so as the carbon dioxide levels go up the temperature goes up there's an observatory in hawaii called mauna loa and they have been measuring the carbon dioxide every year all the time since 1960 and so you'll see that and you'll see the temperature and on my linkedin i spoke to someone earlier tim about why on my linkedin it says how many parts per million CO2 when I was born, which was 319, and now it's 100 more. It's 25% more in the atmosphere than when I was born. So, you know, this is the, the beast we have to tame. So, other things people say is, well, half a degree, one and a half degrees, this doesn't sound very much, right? That's just like a better day in the garden, isn't it? But these are average global temperatures. We are... You know, we've, we've had a Paddington Bear theme this morning. We are the Goldilocks of all of nature. We have a teeny tiny variability that we, that we can survive in and grow our food and have clean water and be able to survive. And this little rise in temperature, which by the way, you know, we're working to Paris one, you know, one and a half degrees rise. I think we've blown it already, guys. I don't think most of the scientists agree now. We won't be, we will go beyond one and a half degrees. We're at 1.1, 1.2 now, greater rise. And you can see the effects that are starting to happen. But these things make a difference. You know, we're now going to have Arctic once a decade. It will, there will be no sea ice. Whereas it used to be once a century. It's like a freak event. Um, half as many people will experience water shortage if we'd have just kept to one and a half. There'll be twice as many with water shortage. Um, permafrost will start really being, releasing more CO2. And there's lots of these tipping points that they all talk about. And we don't know what they're going to mean. We don't know what they're going to mean. But 
they mean there's going to be big releases of CO2 into the atmosphere. There's going to be um, lots more flooding from sea level rising. And we've seen this summer lots of examples of this. All of us have had an experience that shows us that something's different, whether it's our two days in Surrey with 42 degrees where we couldn't leave the house. And I had someone come around later that week talking about pensions, and I said to him, so what was that like for you? And he said, oh, it was hot, wasn't it? I was like, yes. I said, what did you do? And he said, oh, it didn't change much, really. I said, really? I said, how interesting. What did you do those two days? And he said, oh, I just sat in the house. I said, did you shut the curtains? Yes. I said, do you normally sit in the house with the curtains shut then? He said, nothing much changed. He went, well, no. I said, how do you do your business? Because you're sat in my living room right now. And he went, oh, yeah, I go out of the house and travel around. I said, would you have done it that day? No. Well, so if that was a month, what would happen that month? And um, he was like, oh, I hadn't really thought about that. So this is what is sort of the reason why we need to get our act together. How is it going to affect me? Why do I care that there are... It wasn't a third of the land in Pakistan. It was actually about a sixth of the land was underwater. 30 million people were homeless. Still are, by the way. But these things will affect us. We've just experienced what happens when... Russia invades Ukraine and how the massive ricochet effect of that. So something happening in other parts of the world in a global economy affects everybody and all of us will need to get real about that. Whether it's with wildfires, where we saw people in London lost their homes this summer because they had a compost heap in their back garden. Or drought, where actually, again, I, you know, I experienced that. I had to fill up my bird bath three times a day, right? Because there was constant creatures, little insects, sitting around it the whole day, because otherwise they were going to die. You know, and the birds were, you know, wasting it by washing in it. But um, drought will change how we can grow food, where we can grow food, what type of food we can grow. Mm. The coffee beans that you all drink coffee from, Arabica, they're going to have to change that, because they're not drought resistant. They're already changing it because it doesn't grow in this stuff. So all of these things will have economic impacts on all of us. And we work in healthcare. And healthcare and health is inextricably linked to climate change, which I think is why things like the NHS really do pay attention and want to do this. So these factors that you can see here are all affected by climate change and will become worse through it. I always place, don't look up on all my LinkedIn posts, because after I watched that film, which I thought was about COVID, I've decided it was actually about climate change. And some of the big scientists of the world, like Peter Camus, they constantly refer to it and they quote from it. And they quote the last line of the film, which is why we tried we, by God, we tried, right? As the meteorite hits the planet. And um, this guy, 600 years ago, do you know who this is, by the way? Anybody? No, I mean, he's a bit incognito. This is Machiavelli. Right? So 600 years ago, he says, you know, the incredulity of mankind who will never admit the merit of anything new until they've seen it proved by the event. And this is why we're in this tricky time right now, because we don't really want to believe it, and we don't really think it's going to be that bad, and maybe someone else will solve the problem, and maybe it will go away, but it's not going away. And your children, and my children, and their children will have to deal with this big, big time. So here's what uh, the IPCC, these scientists that all agree on everything, who know, never normally agree on anything, they have said, we've literally got three years. You know that big graph where it was all rising up? We've got three years to stop that rise from this year. And then we've got to get it down half again by 2030. And I don't think, based on the fact that our tomato used six to eight tablespoons of oil, we quite grasped how we can do this and what this is going to look like and what this is going to be about. And we are all basing our society on GDP. Growth, you know, I'm constantly seeing people in every company I've ever worked on, what is our strategy? And they put up growth, growth, growth. And I'm like, well, that's imaginative. But they're the VPs saying, this is what we're doing, growth.
But growth doesn't take into account the price you've paid for this. The growth of the oil companies doesn't take into account the price we're all going to pay for it. So we're going to have to think about how do we do that with GDP and how do we mix in the price you pay for it through the resources that you're using in your finite world that you want infinite growth from. So here's another problem we've all got. Carbon literacy. You know, the reason I went back to university was because I didn't know what anyone was talking about. What is net zero? You know, it's a stupid thing to say, in a way, because it doesn't make any sense. It's not something your average man's going to go, oh yeah, net zero. I ask people all the time, what does net zero mean? Uh, well, it sort of means like you don't emit as much as you put out or something. But all it means is we can't keep adding CO2 to the atmosphere. We have to take it out as fast as we add it in some shape or form. And all around the world, while you see people compensating with forests and mangrove swamps and peat bogs that are being developed is because those are the things that suck the CO2 out of the atmosphere. And our carbon footprint was a BP construct, as you mentioned in our conversations on LinkedIn. You know, they decided, let's make it everyone else's problem, the individual's problem. You're the problem, because you eat a tomato from Spain, right? But it's the price we're paying. The carbon footprint is the price we're paying for our activities using energy. That This was something that was quite revelationary for me. So... Fossil fuels are 100 million years of energy captured that we just burn in a moment. And as soon as I understood that, I was like, okay, this is why we can't do this in the way we're doing it, because we're cheating. But we need to cheat because we're all used to this world now, aren't we? So uh, how are we going to do something? I'm curious, show of hands, how many of you have heard or internalize the phrase carbon footprint. Have you ever thought, what's my carbon footprint? I want to reduce my carbon footprint. Anyone? Yeah, you're just raising your hand because everyone else was. <laughs> Anyhow, yeah, this was this was a PR campaign. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the big oil, saying, hey, you know, just don't look behind me. Just you guys are better recycle. Yeah. Which is a pittance relative to well, and major infrastructure. Absolutely. So, you know, but we work for big companies that can do things, and they are doing things. And, you know, by the way, the single biggest contribution you can make to reducing your own carbon footprint is you have one less child. I know, it's too late. It's too late. It's too late. So why healthcare? Why is there this big focus on healthcare? Well, healthcare is a big emitter, right? Healthcare, 4.4% of global emissions are from healthcare. In the UK, 5.4% of emissions are from healthcare. And that's twice as much as air travel, by the way. So the NHS, with its net zero plan, cares about travel and transport. It's outside, you saw that term, greenhouse gas protocols. The greenhouse gas protocol is those scope one, two and three things. I'll talk a bit about it in a minute. But travel to and from their sites, three and a half percent of all the traffic on the roads in the UK is because of the NHS. So You're saying part of their plan is, hey, everybody be more ecological when you come to our office. Yes. You could all walk or take bicycles. This yes, they're electrifying, all of their, they're electrifying all of their, all of their own fleet. But also they're going to start measuring into and out of sites, right? So if our reps are driving diesel cars, pretty soon that's going to be not allowed, right? The, you know, you talked about my skepticism yeah. before you came up. Um, electricity still is energy, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely. So absolutely. even but, our electric cars, yeah. I'm being ecological, yep. how yep. much so? Yeah, so, well, the, the thing about electric cars is they can be powered with renewable energy. But you've got a problem with building them and throwing them away and that whole ethos, you know, the, the real thing we should be doing is just having a car on our street that we all share and stuff like that. And eventually, weirdly, especially if you live in cities, it happens in Brighton where I used to live, you know, there's a big carpool and loads of people don't have cars. They travel on public transport and then when they want to do a particular journey, they use one of the cars from the carpool. It sounds like crazy to us now, but this is the way it will go. 
but um, we both saw the talk, the TED talk on electric vehicles right now. If you're thinking about being the best you can be, you should have a hybrid vehicle because it uses a little tiny battery, but you actually save your emissions in those short-term journeys. And also buying electric vehicles that are big, there is a point to that for society because all of that stuff will come down in cost and come down in impact the more and more. So if you can afford it, maybe you should be doing it. You mentioned growth. Well, electric vehicle companies talk about their growth, and I'm given to understand that if we were to make the projected number of vehicles that they each say they will do, there will not be enough lithium on the planet to make those batteries. Right. It's simply not going to happen. Right. So we're in this place. I was talking earlier about, uh, I I like in this moment to when you're, uh, I have never been in one, but I do know someone who has in a tsunami where you're stood on the shore and the, the, the water is going out and everyone's stood there going, what's going on? What do you think we should do, right? And, and we're about to be hit with the big tsunami. And the things you're describing are the reality of what we're going to have to do. Mm-hmm. But in our short term now, what are we going to do? Well, we're, we're going to get in the right headspace and we're going to start thinking about how we can do this better. And there's simple mm-hmm. principles to do that. So people aren't ready to hear only one of you on this street can have a car, or none of you need a street living in a uh, car living in this city. You know, they're not ready to hear that. I'm going to steal myself from saying any more. I'm, I'm very interested for the slide where you say how Boston Scientific is going yeah, to achieve yeah. that zero. Yeah, yeah, well, I'm not going to exactly say that, because they'd have to, you know, I could say it, but then they'd have to kill me. So here's what the NHS has said. Right, Deloitte did this with them. I know the guys at Deloitte because they talked on my course and I sent a LinkedIn invite and I said, let me talk to you afterwards. And the guys at Deloitte, they've said 56 other health systems are currently working with them to do this. So this isn't just the NHS. So here are the ways that they are moving towards net zero with their own direct and indirect emissions, which are not the bulk of emissions. These are the things that you're in control of in your company and in your NHS or in your health system. And we've talked about some of those already and I'll talk about some more of them in a bit. And then there's the indirect emissions and that's all of us. And anyone who makes medical devices, anyone who makes medicines, anyone who serves the NHS through its food or building things, all of their emissions. And then there is that pesky travel group there for um, us to think about. So here's where they're going to get their emission savings from in the plan that's going to be in 56 countries near you soon. And here is the bit that's us as medical devices. It's a big part of the expectation. It's written into procurement law. They are mandated to have at least 10% of their tenders from now on, which must have a fighting climate change aspect to it. And one tender came out recently, it was for hand gels, but it was 90% on this. Susan, the x-axis on the previous slide was impossible to read. Could you tell us what we were looking at there? I don't know, because I'm now going the wrong way. How do I get back? Hit the left side of the... I am doing that, but it's going the wrong way. Could you come and help me? Yes. We can always edit out this part of the presentation. I don't mind. It's just, you know, press the left and it went right. Weird, huh? So let's go back up to here. Right, you were talking about this one, were you? Yes. Okay. But now I can answer my own question. I could just look. Oh, I can't. Even even this is too small to read. What does it say? I don't know. What is this? It says non-pharmaceutical suppliers and the next one says pharmaceutical suppliers. So these two big bars are med devices and pharma. What does that mean practically? That means without us reducing our emissions as suppliers and proving that we're doing so and changing how we go about our business in the NHS, they will not hit their target. So the more we get through the years from now, the more extreme that will get. And there's a plan, you know. So apparently by 2020, 
apparently by 2027 we'll, we'll need to know about the carbon footprint of our devices and they'll be making decisions as to whether, well you can go on the framework, we've got a bit of extra time today haven't we, yeah. we can go on the framework if, um, if your carbon footprint's less than what you're replacing, this is where we're going. So, you know, this is us. Company X, these are the things you have to think about. Your fleet, your fossil fuels, your generators, chemicals and refrigerants you're using, and the purchased electricity for your real estate. That's the easy bit. So we're all changing our key distribution and manufacturing sites, Boston Scientific are, to renewable energy. We've reduced our emissions by 50% in these categories in the last five years. We've got a load of our manufacturing and distribution plants all totally powered by renewable e electricity. We manufacture in Ireland, we manufacture in Costa Rica. These are all places where you can do this. Costa Rica is amazing. They've been on to this for years. The environment, carbon footprints, becoming they, again, Costa Rica as a country, are aiming for carbon neutrality by 2030. Full stop. They won't be an emitter anymore. Denmark's another one. You know? And the way that you do it is through some principles that we're going to talk about. But this bit on the left is the easy bit. The majority of your emissions are going to be on the right. At least 60%. I would say 80%. And these are the things that you're going to have to um, deal with. Field force travel, employee commuting, everything you purchase and the companies you purchase them from and their actual emissions in creating what you're using. Operational waste, device disposal, using devices, healthcare professionals, shipping of your devices. So now you can start to think, OK, well, this isn't all about plastic and precious metals. But interestingly, we did a life cycle analysis on one of our products. It's quite expensive to do a full life cycle analysis. What we discovered was that 25% of the carbon footprint of that product was in the platinum tip. 25% of it was in the gold that was embedded in the circuit boards. So half the carbon footprint of your device is the precious metals that are in it and the other half the plasticky stuff, some of which are mixed polymers that you cannot recycle. And all of it is built not with breaking it down in mind. So you could snip the tip off, and they do. Some of NHS hospitals snip the platinum tip off and they recycle it, and they get the money back for it. This is quite groundbreaking. And there are companies out there that will do this, but they won't do it for 10 devices or 30 devices or 100 devices. We're looking at recycling some of our products and they're doing things as loss leaders at the moment and only one company in Germany would touch it rather than the thousands that exist because it wasn't big enough volumes for them. So we're all going to have to club in it together to do that. But this is how you move in that direction, Joe. right? You take what your stuff's made from and you don't do that. That is our linear economy. That is what we do right now. And going back to my first slide of only a madman or an economist thinks you can get infinite growth from a finite environment, and your point about lithium, it's all the same thing. You can't just dig stuff up forever and chuck it away. There is no landfill left in Europe. Zero. I only found that out last week. I couldn't believe it. So we either burn it or we ship it somewhere else. And they're stopping that now. Because they're, you know, it's just a mess in the third world with all our rubbish going around there. So, this is what we've got to do. We've got to get our heads around a circular economy. And this is not difficult to understand. It's just not what we do now. But we can do it. We can do anything, right? We can make amazing single-use devices from platinum and gold and plastic. So we can easily do this. We make things... You use them, you might reuse them, you might use them for longer than you did before, you might remake them, you definitely recycle them, and you reduce how many of them you need to have. When you talk to the healthcare leaders in the UK, we will have to move to prevention. 
we will have to move in that way. But that doesn't mean we're not going to need medical devices. That doesn't mean they don't have to be sterile. That doesn't mean that they don't have to be safe. I'd like to see the rest of your slides, if you could. So here's our challenges. Packaging. Already in the Nordics, we're being asked to be responsible for our packaging. Take it away. We don't want it. It's your problem. We're buying your goods, not your packaging. Single use and composition of them. So we're going to have to use precious metals. We're going to have to use plastics. This is how we do things. They're good in terms of the patient outcome. So what plastic are we using? Does it have to be a mixed polymer? Could it be a single polymer, which can then go to recycling? Anesthetics. Big, big focus on that now. Does your thing mean you use less anaesthetic? Could it be local sedation? Because that's one eight hundredth of an anaesthetic gas. Um, big part of the carbon footprint. Travel. How are we getting to and from? Do we need to travel? Could we do stuff remotely? Could we count how much of the non-travel incidents there were when you're training your clinicians or getting your sales force to support a case? In the interest of time, so we have time for interaction with the group. It also says distribution and supply chain, waste and disposal, quality and safety. If you could, the next slide. Yep. So these are the things we have to do. Become carbon literate. Know what you're talking about. Take a bit of time. It doesn't take forever. I've managed it and I'm not a genius, right? Get your culture to get into the headspace of this. Start talking about it. Start getting people to come and talk to you about it. People from other industries, people who've had success. Join with other companies who want to achieve the same as you, who maybe aren't competitors. Follow a framework to set your targets. Follow a framework to disclose on progress. And just remember, and we'll finish on this slide, right? Every hour of a procedure is 32 kilograms of, carbon, of greenhouse gases. So if you're doing something that shortens that, that's a good thing. Every night a patient isn't staying in hospital because of what you do is between 3 and 13 kilograms of waste. Every time you remotely monitor or follow up a patient, that's on average 18 kilograms. You can count this, you can show it, you can demonstrate it. So think waste and think patient pathway and you've got a route to improve things as we go along. I appreciate the, the conversation. I think yours is an unenviable position because it's so easy to attack the premise uh, because your presentation largely said, we really need to, we should, we must, soon we will have to. And like you said, we keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off. Um, I'm reminded of, and I don't remember the specifics of it, but have you ever heard of the prisoner's dilemma? I know you did because we learned it at school. Um, where basically, like, if you both agree to tell the truth, there's a good outcome. If you lie and you tell the truth, then you're going to really make out okay. If you do the same, then you're going to make out. And if you both choose to make out really well, it's going to be catastrophic for you both. So do you both fight honestly? Or do you, one of you lie and put the other one in jail forever? That type of thing. And who among you, just show of hands, how many of you own a car? Everyone in the room? You don't own a car? Good for you. I own first. OK. How many have more than one car? Yeah, see, that you're a motorcycle car. A motorcycle car. Um, how many of you here, just for this initiative, which is very important, are willing to just stop using it or sell it or get rid of it? Thank you, Luke. <laughs> and so, in this prisoner's dilemma, we're all going to keep driving, but thank you. That'll help. It'll definitely help the environment. And so, yeah, I mean, it's just so hard. Even, even what you've explained, we have to. Has Boston Scientific materially done it yet? Or well, they've materially to? done scope one and two, and they've got their plan for scope three. So here's a way of looking, thinking about it. I think about this, you know, like dominoes that knock each other over in a line. Right, for Boston, we've committed publicly, as a publicly owned company, with shareholders, to hit net zero by a particular time, and we have published how we're going to do that, and had those, those targets validated, by a third party that's nothing to do with us, right? That's called science-based targets, that's the race to zero. Lots of big companies have signed up to do this. For us to do this, everyone who supplies us has to be doing the same thing. 
It's like a domino thing. It will fall, boom, 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 boom. Because without committing to do things in this better way, no one will manage to achieve it. And so they won't be using, we'll use company B, we won't use company A. And what we're all going to have to do is think, okay, well, when we're recycling our stuff, we're all going to have to club together for that bit because we can't do it. And this is how it will go. And, you know, think back 30 years ago, what was going on then? We were talking about it earlier. You know, I was driving around in a car. I had to stop at a phone box to ring my boss once a week, right, and tell him what was going on or if something amazing had happened on the day. I filled out all my call sheets on bits of paper and I posted them off. So that was 30 years ago. So how much difference is this going to be 30 years ago? You always underestimate the change in 10 years and overestimate the change in two years. So this is sort of going to happen. Anyone want the microphone to add, ask? Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Ed Capobianca, um, CEO of a small med device company. Um, I'm going to be talking later, so two quick questions. Number one, how much in your view, and your because you've been talking the NHS, how much of the NHS's decision making when purchasing devices, particularly new devices, does any of this feature? Yeah, so that's so that's, that's it. That's in all tenders. Ten percent of the weighting has to be from ten percent. So at least one tenth of what you're being sort of me measured on will be something along the lines of this at this moment in time, and then. In five years from now, it will get much more stringent. So you've got five years to sort of get your act together. You've got to show willing at the moment, I would say. You've got to show that you're thinking about it, and you've got to come up with ways where you're reducing things in some shape or form. Yeah, yeah. Center and, and my second question is, because we are a new device, yeah. is it right, fair, and proper for us to say, uh, you know, the old, well, I don't have to run faster than the bear, I just need to run faster than you. Yes. If I compare what our device does relative to what they're using today. Yes. Is that is that good enough? Yes, it is. And the more you can articulate that, the better. Because we're at that moment where the sea's going out and no one knows what's going on, right? So if you can start to articulate it well, you'll be doing better than everyone else. Okay. Yeah. Great. Anyone else? I'll give you an example very quickly. Please. One of my, I sit on the ABHI, I'm the head of the chair of the sustainability group. I also am the vice chair of the commercial policy group. I'm very commercial. I'm not, you know, a, you know, a sandal, I am wearing sandals, but you know. I, I am commercial. I spoke to my colleague who's the chair about this and the next day he came back to me and he went, Michelle, you'll be really proud of me. I got rid of a million plastic bags overnight. We sent our tubing around that isn't sterile in a plastic bag that wasn't necessary. We just put a little clip on it now and send it off. One million every week. Boom, boom, boom. So you can start to articulate this, then that's what the NHS wants to see. And the Nordics, and the Nordics are getting more into substances as well. So it's going to be tricky. It's the Wild West. But articulate it, pay attention to it, measure it, think about it. It's all you have to do right now. Michelle Sullivan, ladies and gentlemen.